Thank you. My name is Martin Lavelle. I'll be playing the role of Rick Mattoon today. Um, I'm a business economist for the Chicago Fed, but based here in Detroit. Um, as a business economist, one of my main job duties is to contribute to the Chicago Fed's uh, beige book contribution, so focusing on business activity, and, and uh, one of those focuses is how uh, the labor market is functioning within our, our district and based here in Detroit, more specifically in Michigan and uh, within our region and the city. I'm honored to be moderating this panel on motivating inclusive job creation. So on your uh, program summary, I've edited the verbiage a little bit, given what we're going to focus on, I think, during our conversation. So attracting corporations and businesses is aimed at attracting workers in order to address labor shortages. Now we think of the efforts to draw large corporations, such as the Amazon sweepstakes from and that are still going on over the last year that will attract highly educated and younger workers. But these attractions also involve drawing lower skilled workers that are needed to help the regional economy function. Now attraction though often equates to the offering of incentives and subsidies which can be costly, but they don't seem to be going away. Um, locally in Michigan, uh, if you know Dan Gilbert, who's a, a big backer behind Detroit's rebound, um, also got th passed through the state legislature transformational brownfield tax incentives that will allow him to um, you know, earn a little bit back on his new construction on the old Hudson department store site for the next 20 years, in addition to other tax incentives he's receiving. So, and those are, you know, are going to be worth in the tens of millions of dollars when, once, that, uh, once that is summed up. So the questions this session will look to address are, one, how can incentives benefit existing residents and ensure that the benefits of job creation are distributed equitably? And what are private, public, and nonprofit policies that can enhance job competitiveness and enhance workforce development? Um, two issues, obviously, that are an ongoing focus within the city and within, within our region and around the country. So to help us answer these questions, we have the following panel I'd like to, to welcome. Um, presenting her research first will be Martha Ross, a fellow at the Brookings Institute and fellow within the Metropolitan Policy Program. And then we'll be joined by Greg LaRoy, who's the Executive Director of Good Jobs First, and Jeff Nobauer, the Executive Director of Higher Expectations for Racine County from Wisconsin. So. I'd like to invite Martha up to uh, present. She's going to deepen our understanding of who's out of work and who might take advantage of policies and incentives that are designed around job creation. So please welcome Martha. Thank you. Um, I'm with the Brookings Metropolitan Policy Program. We're one of the five programs within Brookings, and we focus on cities and suburbs and regions. Um, and our general focus is how they can be more economically healthy and socially inclusive. So we, I have colleagues who work on economic development and demographics and infrastructure, and my, my beat is the labor market. So what I'm going to talk about today is some research drawn from a paper uh, that we released last year called Meet the Out of Work. And I'm going to present some data specific to Detroit. And if I could ask a question now, how many of you are from Detroit or live in Detroit? Okay, so I need to ask you a favor. One of the occupational hazards of my job is coming to a place at, armed with data and PowerPoints and talking about that place to people who live there and know it quite well. So sometimes there are things in data where people who live there are kind of like, well, that seems weird. So what I'd like you to do if that happens is raise your hand and bring it up. Because otherwise what I think you will do is just disengage and think, well, she doesn't really, you know, whatever. So some there might be a weird idiosyncrasy thing with the data. I might have interpreted it wrong. I might have missed something. So please just engage with me on that. Um, so more on the paper. We wanted to get beyond the unemployment rate. Um, 
and to get a better understanding of the people who are on the sidelines of the labor market and at the local level. People experience the economy most, um, most powerfully at the local level in their own experience of the labor market. Can they find a job, a better job? How, how is their family doing in the labor market, their neighborhood, their city? Um, and they often hold their local officials accountable for how they can do in the labor market. Now, mayors and county executives and city councilmen don't control interest rates, they don't control trade policy, but they do have policy levers at their disposal and they do have funding streams and they have constituents who want them to do something. Um, so we wanted to take a look at that dynamic, at the people who are the constituents of local officials um, who are out of work. So a little bit of housekeeping detail here. We focused on adults age 25 to 64. We've got forthcoming research coming out on young adults 18 to 24. Um, and we focused on people in large cities and counties, which we defined as people as places that are over 500,000 in population. And the people who live there, that's equal to nearly half of all 25 to 64 year olds. So that's how concentrated our population is. Um, and labor markets are mostly regional in nature. I mean, people cross city and county lines all the time. Um, but we decided on the city or county as our unit of analysis because that's the administrative unit of government. There's not a regional mayor. There's a mayor of a city who has counterparts with you know, um, elected officials in surrounding counties. Um, and they're the ones who can set policies and control funding. So although we, Although all these places pass the threshold of 500,000, there's still a fair amount of variation. There's the big places, Chicago, LA, New York. Um, there's also a lot of mid-sized places like Albuquerque, Milwaukee, Louisville, Nashville, um, and then places that are much less densely populated and uh, have, have kind of a suburban or a rural feel like um, some places in Ohio, some places in California and Texas. So the first order question is, who is out of work? How do you define that? Um, we used census data from the American Community Survey. So we were using their definitions and measures. So first of all, what you see is that there's 79 million adults in all of those jurisdictions combined. So that's all of the adults. The second bar with the orange part highlights who's unemployed. That's about 5% or 4 million. These are people who are not working and have actively looked in the past four weeks. So a critique of that measure, as you all would know, is that it's too narrow. There's a lot of people who would like to work, but have not filled out a job application in the last four weeks or have not gone to a job board because they are discouraged. So then the next category that you have is people who are not in the labor force and they are neither working nor looking for work. This is possibly the group I never need to explain that to because you know these terms as economists. Um, so that's highlighted in the green bar. That's 21% or 16 million. Now this is a really diverse group of people. They're doing different things with their time and they have different motivations for working or not working or not seeking employment. Um, but do you wanna call that 20 million out of work? No. <laughs> you don't, um, because to determine whether someone is out of work, you have to know something about what they want or how they are behaving, or you need to make judgments about how they should be spending their time. Um, and the census data do not allow us to do that. So we did, we did our best. Um, we subtracted a bunch of people. First, we wanted to filter out those who seem to be doing other things that are seen as alternatives to employment. So are they raising kids? Are they going to school? So we subtracted most students and we subtracted our best guess of economically comfortable stay at home parents. And then we subtracted people receiving retirement or social security benefits or disability benefits on the grounds that they've signaled that they're most likely not going back into 
the labor force. Um, so once we did that, uh, we subtracted about 10% of the unemployed and a little more than half of those who are not in the labor force. And we ended up with a population of 11.3 million that we called the out of work, and that's 14% of all of the adults. So now, who are these folks? They are diverse, but their shared characteristic is that they're not working. So they are disproportionately disadvantaged. Um, more than a third live in poverty compared with 13% among all adults. They have low levels of education. A quarter have less than a high school diploma compared to 13%. Only 26% have worked in the past year. That's compared to 79% of all adults. Their median age is 44, and one quarter of them are over the age of 55, so they're re nearing retirement age. And I mean, I think as a whole, we need to rethink when retirement age is, but for now, we're stuck with our old language and categories and um, thinking of 65 as an endpoint when we know that it's not. Um, but nonetheless, not everyone is disadvantaged here. There are some folks who are probably just cyclically unemployed and they're going to do just fine. We probably cast the net um, pretty widely and uh, got some people who are happily not working, don't think they need to work. Um, if they're very low income, it could be that they're going to do better if they work, but that's a separate question. Um, so now let's look at who fit that criteria in Detroit. So when we applied those filters, we got 83,000 adults, or about a quarter of all of the adults in Detroit. Um, and they, um, so th that's higher than what we saw nationally. Uh, the median age is 42, but there's a pretty wide distribution, a pretty wide age range overwhelmingly African-American, reflecting the demographics of the city. They have a relatively strong interest in working. 43% of them w are actively looking for work. That's compared to 36% among the total. Um, but only 21% have worked in the past year. And two-thirds of them are on SNAP. And about two-thirds of them have a high school diploma or less. So I have just talked a lot, I've just thrown a lot of data at you. Um, but it's not data who walks into community centers or employment centers or community college or fills out a job application, it's people. Um, and people have different strengths, needs, goals, motivations, even when they fit in a similar demographic bucket. Um, and to make our data more accessible, and to try to accommodate that reality, we created different composite personas for some of the people in the out of work population. Um, so these are some of the personas that we made and we gave them names, which we made up. And we made, um, we created backgrounds for them based on data that we saw in the census. Um, so we wanted with this to prompt questions. Um, the first woman on the left there, we named her Patricia. Um, so we wanted to think, how can we help Patricia define and reach her employment goals? What can a job center do? What can a community college do? What can an employer do? So start thinking in terms of what the person wants and needs and is capable of, rather than starting with a program. Um, and as a social policy person, I often start with, well, the federal funding stream has these eligibility criteria. And, blah, blah. and it's just um, that has limitations. Um, so out of the total out of work population, we did a cluster analysis. We borrowed the logic of market segmentation to create groups within the out of work who are similar to each other based on employment related characteristics. Um, thinking that that would also shape, that would also inform us what kinds of programs and policies would help them find a job. So things like disability status, caring for kids, 
limited English proficiency, um, the other demographic things that you see on, on the screen. Um, we, we, use, we identified those variables as what would drive the cluster analysis. And we came out with Detroit with six groups. Um, and you'll see that they're not evenly distributed. There's, um, there's a big swath of the dark blue, and I'm going to talk about them um, probably the most, partly in interest of time. Um, and you'll see that because I am a think tank person and not a marketing person, I gave them a really unoriginal name of Group One. <laughs> On the other hand, it's one of the least judgmental things I could think of. Um, otherwise, labels you get, you can inadvertently get into a lot of trouble. Um, so this first group is the largest. It's about 34,000 people. It's 41% of all of the out of work. Um, the median age is 47. They're all between the ages of 35 and 64. And about one out of five of them are 55 or over. 29% have a disability. Um, they ha so they have some strikes against them in the labor market. Um, they also have a limited work history. Only 16% worked in the past year. And 36% are looking for a job now. So this is a group that is not very strongly attached to the labor market. What we can't tell here is do they want to work even if they haven't looked? Um, we can't tell what are their interests and capacities. What, what do they want to do to be productive and make a difference? That's where the local interventions and the local actors really play a key role. So let me introduce you to these folks. Carmen is 40. She's married. She has teenage kids. She's thinking about going back to work because her family doesn't have much money. And now that the kids are older, she thinks she has time and energy to do that. She has a green card. She mostly speaks Spanish, but she can get by in English. Valentina is 58. She's a former home care aide. She stopped doing that work because A, it is physically hard. And B, she's helping take care of her grandkids. So she may be helping um, her children go to school or work. And then Joseph is 50. He has a high school diploma. He last worked in construction. He is what you would call a discouraged worker because he has officially given up looking. He would like to work. He has skills. He has on-the-job training. He's in an area where there's not much construction work. He's moved in with his brother. So this next group um, is 26% of the total. They're younger. Their median age is 30, and almost all of them are below the ages of 34. This group is much more likely to be foreign-born and to have limited English proficiency. They have lower disability rates. Um, they have higher rates of caring for kids. They have higher rates of looking for work. So here's Patricia. She's a 25-year-old single mom. She didn't finish high school. She hasn't ever worked in a formal job, but she's cared for her kids and several nieces and nephews. Now that her kids are school age, she would like to work outside the home. And Will is 30 years old. He has a high school diploma. He worked in warehouse packaging. Um, he stopped looking for work a couple months ago. He's not married, and he recently moved back in with his mom. This next group is, accounts for 22%. These are folks who have finished high school, and most of them have gone to college um, but have not earned a degree, although some of them have earned an associate's degree. They might have earned a short-term certificate, um, but we can't tell that from the data. And they, are, um, they have the highest rates of going to school. 14% of them are in school. They have the highest rates of looking for work. 
59% of them are looking for work. This is a group that um, is probably in, I mean, all of these groups you can, employers and groups could tap into for talent and training and employees. But this group might be one of the most work ready. Um, and it's, it's a question as to how much this group is a priority or should be a priority balanced against all of the other needs any given jurisdiction has to serve. Um, I think you get the drill that we made up personas, so I will just keep going. <laughs> this last group is um, about 5% of the total. They are all over the age of 55. They have relatively high disability rates. Um, they've all graduated from high school. Uh, and they have relatively they have the lowest share of looking for work. Only 27% are looking for work and only 9% worked in the past year. So one question I think for this group, especially if they're low income, and a lot of these folks are on SNAP, is um, I think we have a policy blind spot for older folks without a lot of recent work experience for whom getting back into the labor market they may want to, um, it might not be a very friendly place for them because of their age and their skills. So then the other, the next group are youngish people with college um, degrees. The next one is older people with college degrees and for some reason their data don't show up. You will just have to live in in speculation. <laughs> um, so what this, all this data does is it raises the question of what do we do? Um, how can local and state officials, how can funders, educational institutions, employers, unions develop or strengthen or diversify their strategies to connect um, residents to employment? And at the most general level, there are two key ingredients. Um, you want to help train people in skills that are valuable in the regional labor market and you want to provide supports that are appropriate to what they need. That could be childcare, that could be counseling, that could be a coach. Um, so this sounds really simple, like, right, you need a, a think tank person to tell you this. Um, but you know, it is deceptively simple because remember, the easiest way, the best way to lose weight or get in shape is also very simple. Eat less, mostly healthy, and exercise. And life gets in the way. <laughs> um, so it can be harder than you think for a variety of reasons to carry out these principles. Um, but, and then, but there's also, around these core principles, there's a fair amount of variation depending on who is doing the work. Uh, it could be a community college, it could be a nonprofit, it could be employers. So there's different, there's different um, sizes and shapes that you will see. Um, and then we also, in this work, looked at what evidence said was effective in helping people get to work. So we mostly, um, for our own sake in bounding the work, we looked mostly at programs that had been evaluated with a formal third party evaluator. Um, however, that is a minority of all programs. Um, and it is not, uh, and while that information is necessary and useful, that's not the only way to be an evidence-based good program. I mean, they're expensive and time-consuming to do. They're really complicated. So any program that has a good sort of theory of the case of how they're, why they're doing what they're doing, what goals they want to achieve, do they have some data to measure progress, are they tweaking along the way, that's an evidence-based program. So there's lots of those in this region. There's lots of those everywhere. Um, and the key is to, to build on them uh, in, a, in a given region. Um, there are, 
there are these programs in varying levels of capacity and performance everywhere. Um, and any effort to help people improve their skills at a, at a big level, at a jurisdiction level or at a neighborhood level. Um, in addition to getting, thinking about the what, you know, what are we gonna do? You have to think about how you do it. You have to get the civics right. Who are the actors who need to be involved and, um, and do the work? Elected officials, educational institutions, the social sector, um, and this work should go hand in glove with job creation and economic development efforts, which is what we're gonna hear about from our panel. Um, what I will say in the interests of time is that in the paper, we list a bunch of these programs that research has shown to be effective for, different, for people at different levels. They involve different levels of readiness and skills and work history. Um, they, they run the gamut from subsidized short-term jobs for people with very low skills and very, or skills, very low levels of education. We don't really have a great way to measure skills at a large level, um, at a population level. Um, so short-term subsidized jobs for those folks who are just really gonna struggle on their own to find work. Um, that includes transitional jobs programs and social enterprise, bridge programs for people who want to go into training but don't have maybe the 10th grade reading level to um, read the textbook for medical assisting and pass the tests. Um, so you have a program to get them ready for that. Job search assistance and counseling is sort of the bread and butter of what our workforce system does every day. And sector initiatives, you get a bunch of companies in the same industry, get them to pool their demand, work together, work with community college educators to try to meet that demand. Two generation program is the kind of thing that you kind of smack your head that why we see this as an innovation when it is such, it's been going on for a long time and it has a very clear uh, it should never have gone away. Uh, it's the idea that if you've got p parents of young children, you help the parents, you help the kids. It's like early childhood and parenting mixed in with skills training. Apprenticeships, and then lastly, a program that was developed in the City University of New York to improve graduation rates among first, among low-income first-generation college students and it doubled or tripled the graduation rates um, which was impressive very impressive and although it doesn't have a direct connection to employment i included it because education on its own has such a strong correlation with the ability to get a job or a better job and with that i will turn it over to our panel. If I could invite the, uh, the panel up and they can turn on their microphones, just make sure they're, they're working and that they can be heard. Greg, are you okay? I'm on. Okay. Jeff? I'm on. Okay. I believe I'm on. Am I on? Uh, I don't think so. Okay, continue. <laughs> or Mar Martha can have the, uh, the handheld mic. Right, I'm on, I believe. She's on now. Okay. So I'd like to start off first and let Jeff and Greg expound on what they do and and also react to Martha's research. So Jeff, why don't you go ahead? Sure. My name is Jeff Neubauer. I come from Racine, Wisconsin. I lead an initiative which we refer to as a career to cradle initiative. It's called Higher Expectations for Racine County. It's part of the Strive Together Network, if that means anything to any of you. Um, 
Our focus is to build a fully capable and employed Racine County workforce. The city of Racine has had the highest unemployment rate in the state for 25 years or more. Um, so we obviously have a problem with our local labor market. We have supply, people who are looking for work, and these are not people who have dropped out of the labor force, but they're what we refer to as the actively unemployed. They're in the unemployment statistics. And we have employers who are looking for employees, but the labor market uh, does not match the two of them up. So the question we ask ourselves is, what's up with that? Why is that not working? And why has it not worked for such a long time? Um, we um, are not unlike, in some respects, I see my friend John Schmidt is here from the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. You'll hear from him tomorrow. He wrote an extensive piece on the front page of the Journal Sentinel that appeared in the Sunday paper um, a couple weeks back. And he compared our uh, rates of adverse childhood experiences in Racine to Milwaukee and, and Detroit, and uh, they're quite comparable, to give you an idea. So we're a smaller version, certainly, of those communities, but we have some unfortunate common characteristics in our uh, population. I loved this paper. I love the cluster analysis. I think it's very creative um, and insightful. Um, the literature review was uh, very strong and very helpful. And I particularly liked where you took the cluster analysis and the uh, strategies that had been evaluated and you put them in the grid to match up the strategies with the different clusters. So for someone like me who is trying to solve this problem, that's a very, very useful thing. Um, we um, are trying to take advantage of the fact that while we have the highest unemployment rate in the state of Wisconsin and have had for many years, we have more jobs uh, going unfilled today than we would require in order to get the city down to the state's unemployment rate, which is 2.9%. And these jobs are listed, they are available, but they are going unfilled. And that's because um, our residents who are in that um, group of the actively unemployed are unable to acquire and or retain those jobs. So we are attempting to break this cycle. And we think we're in a unique position because while we possess many of the same challenges as places such as Detroit and Milwaukee, we're obviously quite a bit smaller. The city of Racine has about 80,000 people. The county has 195,000 people. And we are much, much more aligned. Um, if you go to our neighbors to the north, the first question is, are you for the Milwaukee Public Schools or are you for the voucher schools? And um, if you try and say you're anything but in one camp or the other, you're in the middle of the road. And as a friend of mine from Texas once said, the only thing in the middle of the road is a dead armadillo. And that pretty much is what goes on in Milwaukee. Um, Similarly, in Chicago, for those of you who are familiar with the relationship between the mayor and the Chicago Teachers Union, um, it's, uh, it's not a relationship that uh, works terribly well. In Racine, we can get everybody around the table, um, and we don't focus on a program. You were talking about programs. We focus on the result. And then we build a network of people to work on the result in a cross-sector effort. And we focus on employment, we focus on post-secondary completion, post-secondary enrollment, high school graduation, eighth grade math, third grade reading, and kindergarten preparedness. So we work across that entire spectrum. And we think that we have a shot at breaking this cycle because we have this alignment and our approach is to take a sort of an all of the above strategy. A set of strategies. So we are using iBest Bridges. Um, we are very big on career pathways. Um, we use uh, transitional jobs for the recently um, incarcerated through a terrific organization, the Social Enterprise Goodwill Industries. Um, 
We really like sector initiatives, particularly in construction. We'll maybe hear a little bit about Foxconn from our panelists, <laughs> um, where our state, um, uh, let's just say, invested uh, um, billions of dollars in bringing Foxconn to our neighborhood. And there's going to be a lot of construction. They're building facilities there, allegedly, to, that are uh, 20 million square feet several times the size of the Pentagon. Um, and that construction is underway. And so we're trying to get people trained up to get those construction jobs. And also manufacturing, which is still the largest segment of our economy in Racine County. We're very, uh, very, very interested in two generation strategies and trying to build a very robust offering there. And um, we have a terrific local technical slash community college, Gateway Technical College, that is using accelerated study associated programs. So uh, some of this we've been doing for years. Some of it's in development. But we think we offer an opportunity. And I would love to engage with this group and anyone else who's interested for us to work through what is a bit of, in my view, uh, a catch-22 where we study the big cities because that's where you should study the programs and where you can get half of the people in the country. And when you dice and slice the data, you still got a legitimately sized group that your data can be valid. Right. But moving the needle on a community-wide basis in a place like Detroit is extremely difficult. And we think we can move the needle in Racine. Um, because um, we do have a smaller size, much greater alignment, and we frankly have, while people will debate uh, for a long time to come whether Foxconn was a good idea and the, uh, the public money that was uh, put into that deal was a good thing or a bad thing, one thing it is for certain is a catalyst uh, because it draws a lot of attention and it has also uh, created an opportunity for, for us to draw a lot of workforce investment um, money. And we think that we're going to be able to do some things that we should have been doing for decades, but now we can do and try. And we measure the heck out of everything we do. And we'll find out whether it works or not. Cool. Thanks, Jeff. When I, uh, when I looked at Martha's list of effective practices, I. I go down the list and I think, oh, let's see bridge programs. Detroit does that Trans, uh, through uh, the, skilled, the skilled training that's going to be done for um, construction, the many construction projects that we're going to have in the city. Uh, Mayor Duggan has sponsored a, a program to get Detroiters trained up for that. So maybe developers can meet that 51% Detroit employment target for projects. Transitional jobs programs with a short-term subsidized employment. Multiple nonprofits do that here in the city. Social enterprises, the same thing. Job search assistance and counseling, as well as sector initiatives. The community colleges are big on that here. The two-generation programs, Kresge, um, what they're doing at Marygrove College, um, and as far as doing some, some teacher training, and um, as well as upskill training, uh, also, Sheila's uh, NSO um, uh, organization does that also in terms of, of job training in the old Bell Building. Apprenticeships are growing in number. So Detroit can also check um, all those boxes and what they're doing. Greg? I just want to add one thing. Um, because in Racine, while we're doing a lot of these things or scale, uh, developing these things, what we haven't done is we haven't approached it in a systemic fashion. And We've got isolated uh, initiatives that haven't been woven into a systems change approach and haven't been scaled at the level that they would need to to really move the needle. And I think therein lies uh, the nature of the problem. But I apologize. No worries. No Great. worries. Thanks. Uh, so again, my name is Greg Leroy. I direct a group based in Washington, D.C. called Good Jobs First. We're a nonprofit that I founded 20 years ago. We're a public interest watchdog group on economic development incentives. So enterprise zones, TIF districts, revenue bonds, corporate income tax credits, uh, corporate welfare business incentives, pick your terminology. It's an estimated $70 billion a year that states and cities spend in incentives. But we, that's just a rough guess based on an academic study. Um, 
And we have a big problem right now in the space of incentives that's a very uh, apropos of Detroit and lots of other cities, and that is the total number of deals for which states and cities can compete has been uh, declining and depressed for a long time, l long before the recession. It mirrors the decline in entrepreneurialism in the United States. And at the same time, the big deals like Foxconn and the Amazon HQ2 deal have inordinate power to demand even bigger uh, incentives than they might otherwise have gotten because in if you look at it just from a supply and demand equation, the supply of deals is down, yet demand is up because you've got more public officials anxious to be aggressive on the economy and pull those levers that, that Martha mentioned that they're expected to try to pull to do what they can for the home team. Um, so how many people here are, are from a city that's still in the hunt for the HQ2 deal? Is anybody still here? Which city? DC. DC, okay. <laughs> Any other cities? No? Chicago, of course. All right. So DC and Chicago, two, and DC obviously is three, really, right? It's Bourbon, Maryland, Virginia, and the district. Um, how many people were from cities that were among the other 218 that didn't make the first cut? So almost everybody, right? Everybody's mayor. How many? How many people's mayor did a silly social media thing, or talked to Alexa on TV or something like that, right? Okay. So never before has the economic development profession received this much scrutiny. Um, hanging out with them at some conferences, it's not clear they're all real comfortable with it. I think it's a good thing. I think the amount of interest uh, in the issue was erupted, right? And, and we know there's all that concerted pushback now in a number of the 20 cities, right? There's petition campaigns. There's kind of let us into the debate uh, claims. There's Disclosure lawsuits, people trying to get the bids. Only two of the 20 bids have been fully disclosed now, right now. Um, six cities are com absolutely not at all uh, disclosed, and everybody in between is uh, partially disclosed or highly redacted. Um, but this issue of fairness and the, di the distribution of incentives for incentives, apropos of employment benefits, is absolutely a live issue in this debate, and it's going to play out. I just want to reflect personally a minute. As an old anti-redlining activist, I worked for Gail Sincata and National People's Action in the late 70s when the first HMDA studies were being done and the first CRA challenges were happening. Uh, and then inspired by that work as doing incentives work, I've done geography studies of incentives, including a very big study here in the state of Michigan that we published 12 years ago, where we found that the state under both uh, Engler and Granholm the state of Michigan was redlining the city of Detroit, redlining the inner ring suburbs adjacent to the city in the distribution, the geographic distribution of state incentive deals. We didn't just pick on Michigan. We found the same thing with Illinois redlining uh, Chicago and the minority parts of Cook County, uh, south and western suburbs, for example. We found the same problem in Cleveland and Buffalo. Uh, th this is a real issue. It's another, frankly, state-sponsored discrimination, very apropos of uh, Richard's talk this morning. So, uh, and no matter what metrics you pick, whether it's race or income or plant closings where jobs need to be created by virtue of previous job losses or whether you can get to work by transit or there's tax based stress, by all those metrics, especially in big metro areas, we find that the distribution of incentives is reverse Robin Hood. I don't know how else to put it. So, and I just want to emphasize one other new metric that's coming online that I think. Uh, I'm now speaking, I'm, this is an alert for all professors who have graduate students looking for thesis or dissertation topics or journalists looking for new investigative series. There's a new set of data coming out right now under something called the Governmental Accounting Standards Board Statement 77 on Tax Abatement Disclosures. <laughs> That's a mouthful. Just call it GASB Statement 77. This is the obscure body that sets forth the way governments have to keep their books, right? How they have to report their spending. And for the very first time in its 34-year history, GASB is now requiring most governments, 50,000 local and state bodies of government, to report how much revenue they have lost to economic development tax break programs. They've never had to do it before. Yeah, it's a big deal. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, it's a really big deal. It means that for the first time, if you wanted to say, look at the amount of spending by every jurisdiction in this metro area and mash it up with Gini coefficients, which Governing Magazine just did and found a relationship between spending on tax abatements and higher inequality, or race, or income, or tax-based stress, or pick your metrics um, and ask yourself, how's it going here? Are these effective expenditures? There's a whole new way to ask and answer those questions. So I really encourage people to think about that. 
and we can talk about Foxconn anytime you want. I mean, as a, as a, as a 25 year <laughs> Illinois resident, I love this deal because a big chunk of the jobs are going to go to Illinois residents, and the state's not going to pay a dime for it. <laughs> That's the way our neighboring community, Kenosha, feels, too. <laughs> everybody, everybody knows that about Southeast yeah. Wisconsin employers. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we know where Greg stands on the use of tax incentives and subsidies for, for job creation. But let me ask Martha and Jeff how, how they feel about um, the use of tax incentives and subsidies to, to try and create greater job equality, which could lower income inequality. And I think an argument that Detroit would make is that, so while Dan Gilbert has had a large presence within the city, does everything happen if Dan Gilbert's not down here? Is that if we don't have the catalyst, does do do we even have a seven point two? Is it a you know is it a still a a, a smaller number than that, Martha? I, I, I gotta defer to the to the home team with Foxconn to go <laughs> <laughs> So I was a policymaker. I was chairman of the Ways and Means Committee in the Wisconsin Legislature and a member of the leadership, and um, uh, you know it would be a beautiful thing if we could outlaw these incentives and just get rid of them um, across the country. The problem is, of course, as we all know, uh, we don't have the capacity to do that. And therefore, if you're the mayor or the county executive, how can you not do it? Right. And so we are caught literally between the rock and the hard place where I don't know a single mayor or county executive who likes these ideas. Uh, Governor Walker thought he really liked this idea and thought it was going to reassure him a third term as governor of Wisconsin when the Foxconn deal got done. And it now might be the single issue that will undermine his reelection. So um, who knows? But it would be uh, a great thing for public policy um, and for the people of the country if we could get rid of these things, but I don't know how you get rid of them. So one um, thought that I have that is not nearly as informed by practice and experience as yours um, is that the, the is to think of a longer term game and think about investing in the in the things that make a, the, a place a good place. Um, you know, invest in public goods, invest in education, in invest in the things that Amazon outlined in its RFP that it wanted, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which was good transit, um, local access to transportation networks, higher ed, you know, invest, invest in quality placemaking. And, you know, you can be in, idealist and say, well, it's, it's not either or, um, and, it, and it's not, but it's hard to, I'd, I'd be interested in your take on this as a, as a former legislator, of, of how hard it is to think of the long game when we are in political cycles. Well, I'm a Democrat, and so I have a quick and easy answer to that, and that is we should do it. Uh, <laughs> um, and, but it's a classic free rider problem, right? Yeah. And the other issue, uh, well, it's interesting because um, the seat that I represented 30 years ago is now represented by my daughter, who um, just got elected in a special election in January. And um, she uh, opposed the Foxconn deal, but her view is that now that it's done, we dang well better take advantage of it. And so we now need to make sure we're investing in all of those workforce strategies and in public education and in the public goods that will allow us to hopefully um, at least get maximum benefit from uh, the development that's going to occur. And there aren't very many people who believe that our long-term, generationally unemployed uh, folks in the central city of Racine are going to get jobs at Foxconn, but there will be a domino effect, and um, we believe it will create opportunities for our folks, and we want to make sure that we're uh, at least maximizing those benefits to the extent that we can. So uh, Governor Walker cut the deal. He didn't ask for my advice on that thing. 
He had a thousand acres of open land. He had access to Lake Michigan water. He had it on I-94 in the middle of one of the largest mega cities in the country. I don't know how many other places had the water, uh, you know, seven million gallons of capacity a day and a thousand acres right on the freeway available to them. My guessing, not very many, but then just for good measure, we threw in three, four billion dollars. Um, and, and got the deal. Um, now, um, we just hope we can um, make the most of it. So Greg, I did, I did want to ask sure. you then, what kinds of incentive offerings could work sure. and would be a good use of public money? So again, to bring it back to Detroit, while we were in the Amazon sweepstakes, we don't know exactly how much money and incentives we put up, but if Grand Rapids was going to put up $2 billion in incentives, then we know Detroit was going to put up a heck of a lot more. But one example, maybe where this is, a, where this is public, uh, public policy put to good use, Flex and Gate, the auto supplier that's going to open up uh, later this year, construction started on their facility. They're going to prioritize hiring Detroit um, residents as part of their deal to gain state and local tax incentives and the training of Detroit workers will be done through Focus Hope, which for those of you not familiar with Focus Hope in Detroit, they've grown from a social advocacy group to now they do uh, higher skilled training in, in manufacturing and vocations to help place Detroiters. So, so where can uh, the incentives work for people and policy? Sure. So, um, and this is this tension that's sussing out here between basic public goods that benefit all employers and make a place attractive mm -hmm. to everybody from Amazon to a clutch maker <laughs> is exactly the right tension. And the, and the problem with the way runaway incentives have grown up. So my answer, not to be glib, is incentives work when they actually meet the definition of the word incentive. And to me, that means something that should happen but isn't happening and won't happen until public dollars reduce private risk. And if you distill programs down to that and hold them against that definition, most of them fail now. Because over time, and we've documented this in the cases of programs like Enterprise Zone and TIF districts, what starts out as a narrowly targeted program that's really addressing a so-called market imperfection turns into pork over time. It's deregulated. The eligibility rules are gutted in a way that make them meaningless and can go everywhere. So you can have a TIF district in a cornfield or an apple orchard, as you have had in Wisconsin, like in Baraboo. Or you, know, you can have 1,100 TIF districts capturing $1.2 billion a year in the state of Illinois, including one out of 10 property tax dollars in the city of Chicago. Uh, that's, that's not an incentive anymore. It's a windfall. It's a, ca it's a captured diversion of activity that would normally be supporting schools and other public goods. So, I mean, we did a study showing the extremes here, and, and we're not against incentives per se. We did a study once documenting workforce development programs versus mega deals. We documented 22 mega deals, that's t nine and 10 figure deals, that would cost more than $2 million per job. And we documented 22 workforce development programs that cost less than $10,000 per job. Which one would you rather have? Which one do you think might be more cost effective or that taxpayers ever have a, break, a chance of breaking even on? That, that's the range. That's the problem. So if you go through Martha's paper, you'll see that the best practice that applies to all of her groups, uh, essentially, is the job search assistance uh, one and counseling. And so I, I wanted to ask everybody, how does job search assistance and counseling work when the national unemployment rate is 4.1%? In Michigan, it's 4.7%. It's been below 5% now for more than a year. In Detroit, even when you count those marginally attached to the labor force who are, are underemployed, it's as low as it's been since 2001. In Racine, uh, the similar things are happening. So it's easy when jobs, it's easy for job search assistance to work when the unemployment rate is high, but with it so low, how, how, do, we get, how do we get it to work and what, who do we need to bring to the table? Um, I think one way to get it to work is to switch the focus a little bit and turn it towards employers. Um, and they, 
should not uh, uh, position themselves as passive recipients of talent. Um, they, if as a business decision, they have a stake in having workers in the right place at the right time to meet their business objectives. And they can do that better if they think forwardly, if they build partnerships with job centers and community college and nonprofits and groups like Focus Hope. Um, so I think part of what needs to happen is more on more ongoing relationships between the job centers and the employers, which, which requires both parties <laughs> to be organized and thoughtful. Um, that, and that doesn't always happen. I mean, there's tremendous pressure on the job developers in these, in these job centers to just churn out numbers and, and look for jobs. And the easiest way to do that is to look at employers who have high turnover, you know, like low wage jobs where there's a lot of turnover, there's always going to be another job opening. So you can refer someone there um, that, you know, that person may be not in a job after a while, either because they hate it or it's a bad job or whatever. Um, so the getting people to think long term to create more structured pathways into a job would be helpful. I agree with that. Um, I think they are a necessary but not sufficient condition, to borrow a phrase. Um, and it's important to do that work, but only in the context of a system. Um, because the referrals, um, when we had to move 2,700 people from the ranks of the actively unemployed in the city of Racine to the ranks of the employed, at the height of the recession in order to meet the state's job uh, unemployment rate, um, and that we didn't have 2,700 jobs. You could do all the work in that space of job referral you wanted to, but there were no jobs that didn't really do much. Um, and now we've got more jobs than we have, uh, you know, the number of people, as I said before, that we would need to move. It's rough, it's come down to about 600, 650. Um, but the people can't do the jobs. And so we need to, uh, we, we're operating in what the Strive Together world refers to as a system change in gateway. It's a bunch of nomenclature in the trade, um, wonky talk. But um, we won't know that we're changing the system and that we have achieved um, this broad redesign until we bend the curve. You know, the curve is coming down like this, and there's still a gap, and we have to bend that curve to get us down to the, the state's rate. And that is not going to happen by doing things the way we've always done them. <laughs> we have to do new stuff. We have to do it in a different and cohesive way. And um, that is one component, but it is not going to get it done by itself. So, has, have it, so my answer would be community benefits agreements. Has anybody ever heard of a community benefits agreements? I know it's been a lot of debate here in, in mm -hmm. Detroit, including mm -hmm. your competing ballot initiative uh, proposals. <laughs> so 16 years ago, we published the first manual on community benefits agreements. These are legally binding contracts between developers or employers and community coalitions seeking to ensure that a project doesn't harm an existing incumbent community around the footprint of a project, but rather benefits the incumbent surrounding communities and footprint uh, of the project. And they can be structured in lots of different ways, but typically they include things like first source hiring agreements and affordable housing set-asides and environmental easements and um, amenities like childcare or healthcare facilities or other, um, you know, to make up gaps in neighborhood um, social services. Uh, they're very flexible that way, and then ideally they get legally attached to the redevelopment agreement after the incentive deal is passed, so they become doubly uh, legally binding upon the developer, both as a private contract and then as a, an appendage to a public incentive agreement. Um, you know, even, even in yesterday's New York Times, it's very clear now that the community benefits frame has, and we take some credit for this, we collectively, we're working with a bunch of different groups on the HQ2 fight to uh, we have moved the needle with Amazon right now. If you read the, the leaks that are coming out of the 20 site visits they did for the HQ2 uh, visits, 
they're sensitized. They're asking questions like, how do we engage with local institutions? How do we cushion the blow on affordable housing? How do we make sure we don't create huge traffic jams by amping up transit services? They know they can't get another black eye like they've gotten in Seattle and have the same ill effects they've had on the way uh, redevelopment's happening there. So, so our answer is very much in the same frame. It's getting employers to, ex to agree to expect more but, in, but engage. There's, there's, really, there's a lot of people who want into this process. There's a sophisticated body of experience from all the different kinds of nonprofits we've been talking about today that collectively get you there, right? If, they, if the employers will engage with them and agree to good faith efforts to make it happen. And I think it's a great solution um, for an Amazon because it's so high profile and because they are obviously a consumer product company yep. um, that they don't want a black eye. However, if you move down into the middle market or the lower market uh, deals and you have a community like we're seeing, which is desperate for infill and jobs in the central part of the city, yep. and you go to somebody and say, now we want to talk to you about this community benefits agreement, and they go, hey, yeah, but we could go 20 miles to the west and build on a cornfield and we don't have to do that, then, you know, that ain't going to happen. Um, and we have a very progressive mayor doing a terrific job, but um, he cannot afford to raise the price of development in the city by adding on to those re requirements. So, great question. But what, what's the extra value proposition that Racine offers versus the cornfield, right? You've got, uh, it's, you've further, got it's further from the freeway. It's got more crime. <laughs> it's got higher taxes. Um, and it's a fabulous place to live. Um, and I love it. And my family's been there for over 100 years. Um, but the point is that, you know, when my company uh, that was in my family for four generations was looking to uh, relocate, we had a five-story warehouse in the distribution business, which was crazy. And we needed a one-story facility. Um, in the city where we had been since 1850 as a company, wow. Uh, my family was in it from 1917 on. Um, we could have gone out on a cornfield out near the interstate. It would have been the lower cost alternative. It would have been more efficient in terms of transportation, getting our stuff to Milwaukee and Chicago. Um, we bought the old Massey Ferguson plant in the city of Racine wow. because that's where we wanted to be. Mm -hmm. It was not the economic um, optimizing decision. My professors at the University of Chicago Graduate School of Business would have said, bad call. <laughs> um, but we did it. Um, so, you know, the, at, when, you, when you're working with economics and people are trying to maximize their returns on investment um, and you're not Amazon, yeah. it's tough. No, I'm not, I, don't misunderstand. I think community benefits agreements are most appropriate for big projects that have big footprints and involve big land use yeah. changes. And right? that's Which a great is, thing. Uh, a good description of the, your, what you just talked about. But, right. Yeah. But, and it's a great thing to force Amazon to, to think about these things in that way. And you're gonna, we're going to end up wherever they end up in a better situation than we would have otherwise been. So thank goodness you're doing that work. Fingers I, crossed. I think I have time to go down the line one more time before I, we open it up to to you all. Uh, Martha, I wanted to ask you, especially given some of the topics we talked about earlier, how does job training and this and the job search assistance and counseling work when we have such barriers like housing, access to credit, transportation, and more localized in Detroit? Uh, we think about auto insurance. And, the, and without mass transit, you need a car to get around. And so the high cost of auto insurance preventing maybe someone from taking advantage of opportunities that are available to them? Um, the, the job search assistance that I, it's, that is both a generic term and a specific term. Um, so generically, anyone can, off, you know, can do an assessment of someone's interests and you know, point them to different kinds of job openings. The, the major federal funding for that is through the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. Say, right, WIOA. WIOA. Yeah. Um, and its funding has been flat 
for a long time. Um, so part of the problem stems from the basic resources at hand and, the, and the, how much we are asking the workforce system to do with so few resources. Like, I mean, if you talk to uh, a career counselor in a job center, like they're gonna, they're gonna list all those barriers and, and they're gonna say, you know, I, I can give you a referral, hopefully, if, I, you know, if I'm organized. <laughs> I can give you a referral to an agency that I know has transportation vouchers, but maybe not. <laughs> uh, I mean, WIOA has a grand vision of a seamless system supporting vibrant regional economies. And then you look at the money that goes in and and there's there's just a huge gap between aspiration and what happens on the ground. So so more so a, a more a system that has the authority and the capacity to meet the vision would would have more money and and would look a little different. A lot different. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. I mean, because when we're very practically trying to move 600 people from over here, unemployed, into employment, long-term, oftentimes multi-generational, unemployed in the mainstream economy, or underemployed, that's another several thousand people. Um, we have to look at transportation, child care, drug and alcohol issues, lack of educational attainment, um, just frankly, lack of experience in the workforce, um, and a host of other things. And so, you know, we're building, we're trying to build a system to address all of that. But um, left to their own devices, you know, the market is not meeting those needs. Um, yeah. The market is not functioning. And so, um, what, who gets left behind? The dispossessed and uh, the poor. And then lastly for me, for Jeff and, and Greg, um, and more of a mid-sized city focus actually, this was in today's Wall Street Journal on, and I think I know how Greg might feel about this, is cities are offering money just to come move because they need people to work. Um, Hamilton, Ohio, not far from where I grew up in Dayton, Ohio is doing this. Uh, St. Clair County, Michigan has been doing this for a couple of years. Um, and. Not that they're offering money, but um, such a shortage of workers is needed, or su there's such a shortage of workers in Elkhart, Indiana, um, that in addition to the 50,000 residents who work there, another 25,000 commute in in order to fill up all the open positions. So how do we feel about uh, a program like that where I need people to help the economy function, but I'm, I'm going to offer uh, thousands of dollars to the people to move in or I'll pay down their student loan debt. How, how do we feel about that? Let's grow the pie, okay? Let's reach out to the people who are not currently employed for all the reasons we've been talking about and help them get into the workforce and begin to climb that ladder of opportunity. Let's go to the people who are making eight, nine bucks an hour and who can't afford to take a job that makes a little more or even take a raise because then they lose their Medicaid for their kids or they lose their FSET benefits or they lose their child care subsidies and help them get to the point where they can make 18 bucks an hour with good benefits so that they can jump the cliff. Let's do that. Let's not just pay people who already are doing okay move from one community to the next to the next. It's just the reverse course of paying Amazon to locate in DC or Chicago. This is not the way we ought to go. It's a dumb idea. Yeah, I'm, in, I'm anxious to see this article. This reporter called me early in the research for that and um, mm -hmm. I was scratching my head because I'm, I'm thinking of a couple things. Obviously, placemaking initiatives are about creating magnets for millennials and empty nesters, et cetera, right? That, and that's been going on for a long time, and that's cost-effective and not putting a lot of eggs in one basket, and most of us are probably comfortable transit-oriented development, et cetera. Um, and 
I could understand if you were doing something like forgiving student loans to doctors to maintain vital medical services in underserved rural areas, or I think most of us would be interested in that kind of thing. But just for the private market to pay people to move into jobs that are being asked to be filled, I mean, well, that's what moving vans are for, right? What, what, what's, what's the deal with? So I, I, I'm, I'm open to some disaggregated special niche aspects of this, but otherwise I'm like, <laughs> What's that about? I agree with yeah. that completely. And I, I commend all of you. I mentioned it earlier, but the article that was in the Journal Sentinel that John was just recently received a, um, a national award for uh, his work in this area, Adverse Childhood Experiences in Trauma-Informed Care. Um, there are a lot of people who are sitting on the sidelines because of things that occurred to them earlier in their lives and has altered their brain chemistry and has made it very difficult for them to manage stress. And, um, you know, let's invest in resolving those issues for those people. Um, let's bring them back into the mainstream economy rather than getting into these crazy ideas of, you know, paying millennials to job hop more than they otherwise would. <laughs> um, I'm not a fan. <laughs> All right. That's what um, budget rental trucks for. <laughs> it's uh, it's your turn to ask questions now. So if uh, if you can raise your hand, and we'll find you with a microphone. And once you have the microphone, you have you have the power. So please don't hesitate. All right. Since I'm I'm the first, this question is not fully formed. It's really more a reaction than a question. And I'm hoping the question will come up. So um, Michigan is now uh, putting work requirements for Medicaid, right, 29 hours. Uh, SNAP is requiring, is, work, uh, is requiring, so when you say, sir, that you know, we need to get those people into the work stream, people who may have experienced traumas and so on, we are already seeing punitive policies um, you know, and denying social services uh, and, and trying to bring them into the market. So that's a reaction. Uh, and then I read, so, I, I came here with lots of questions, and I was a little depressed with all the things I've been reading and, and so on, and I thought I'd get answers from you, and now I'm a little more depressed. Um, so, um, you know, you have, we have this deal. We're, we're a state, we're giving back taxes, you know, uh, taxes to the people, so we're not investing in the public resources, the public goods that you talked about, Martha, and we're, we're punishing people, requiring them to work. We're giving corporations all these incentives and tax abatements while they're not paying living, living wages. So you can have a family that works 40 hours, uh, you know, a person that works 40 hours a week and still is below poverty. And then I read Big Hunger, where you have these corporations that don't pay people enough, but then they depend on uh, they, they send their workers to SNAP and depend on, they actually redeem those benefits. So here we are in a very topsy-turvy world where we're denuding our public sphere, we're, we're essentially allowing, we're privatizing a public goods in the public sphere. And, um, and then we're talking about how to connect people to, to jobs in this in this market when corporations are not, you know, are, we're giving our public tax dollars to corporations and and we're not demanding enough of them. And while we're giving away tax, you know, we're we're making tax cut after tax cut. So there's there's so much that's wrong with this picture. And I'm sorry, there's not a question here, and I'm, I'm but I, I want you to react to what I just said. Well, I'll be happy to react. <laughs> um, so you have a single mom with kids. Maybe she dropped out of high school, one of the people in your profile. And if she goes to work, she loses her Medicaid because she's no longer income eligible. So her kids don't have health insurance. But if she doesn't work, she loses her Medicaid because she's not working. Because she's not working. What is going on here? This is, in, this is craziness. I understand why it happens. Among my other activities, I used to be chairman of the Democratic Party of Wisconsin. I understand polling. I understand activating a base. I understand coming up against a blue wave if you're a Republican. I get all of that. But on the policy merits, there is no justification for that. 
in my view. And I don't want you to be depressed. I want you to be hopeful because we can do something about this stuff aside from just uh, turning out the vote, which is a good thing to do. We can actually put our heads together and take the work that Martha's got in her paper and that others of you can, are contributing and we can design better systems, we can get them to work and then we can become models for other communities. We should come out of this hopeful that we can really make a difference, that we can bend the curve. I'll let the questioners get the floor here. <laughs> I guess I need to push the on button. Um, I was interested in the topic of jobs retraining and um, would like to hear your comments on the extent to which individuals who are unemployed are interested in job retraining, particularly if they may have been in a line of work for a number of years and that particular industry or that particular skill set no longer exists. Um, uh, or if they're at a point in their lives where you know, they're of a certain age and retraining just isn't that appealing. Well, do you know the work of James Heckman, um, who's a, a, a Nobel Prize winning economist at the University of Chicago, studied this question back in the 80s, and he found out that the Job Training Partnership Act, JETBA, didn't really work, and he was surprised. And uh, which was not the result that either Tip O'Neill or Ronald Reagan were anticipating. Um, and so he went on a journey to find out what's the answer to that question. And that has led uh, to a lot of the work that many of us are now doing. So, um, and the issue is essentially, and this is going to be oversimplified and, and, and not really fair to Professor Heckman's work, but if someone has a strong social network and um, maybe a strong family support and they lose their job, um, they find a way. And if someone doesn't, they fall right through the bottom of that safety net and you can give them job retraining and it doesn't help as much as one would hope. And I noticed in your paper that this is one of the less effective strategies, um, which is um, a surprising, but in my experience also true. Um, one, one issue to think about is uh, something called wage insurance, where someone who has, who has has had a career, like a, maybe a, have any of you read Janesville? Have you, have you heard of it? Uh, it's, a, it's a story about a, um, it's set in a Wisconsin town where a auto factory closed and the reporter follows a bunch of the laid off workers. Um, and they have a ton of experience, a ton of skills. They have homes and mortgages and families. They don't, I mean, some of this gets into pretty, um, like, so deeply rooted social norms. Like a manufacturing guy, at least these guys, didn't want to go into training to be in healthcare, which is a growing industry and where the community college had some good training programs. It just was not a good fit. Um, one of them became a, like, got a job at a plant like four hours away and went there during the week and came home during the weekend. Um, but so this idea of, of wage insurance is that for, may, for maybe it's for a while, maybe it's for a long time, um, you're not going to be able to find a job that supports you at the level you were at previously. Like the economy has changed. You, like maybe you're the equivalent of a, of a buggy whip maker, maker, at least at that moment. Um, but you are productive. You have a lot to contribute. You can take another job. It's not going to get you at the same wage, but, at, but the pub, public dollars can be used to boost your wages, at least for a while, so that you don't 
so that the floor doesn't drop out immediately and that, so that you have at least a cushion of some time to think about options. I, I don't have a lot to add. I mean, uh, the only other footnote I'd say is that um, among the horror stories coming out about plant closing and effectiveness in the 80s spurred the enactment of the Warren Act in 1988. H.W. told Reagan to get the issue off the front page. And so we got the 60-day Advance Notice Act, the Warren Act, which took effect in early 89. But, the, but by everybody's admission who's ever looked at it, right, it's all only about getting to the workers before they're scattered to the wind to make sure they get enrolled in UI mm -hmm. and trade adjustment assistance if they're qualified for it or other social safety net programs and try to at least increase the enrollment ratios and outcomes marginally um, before people are scattered. Yep. Now I will say, if it's in adjacent, to pick up on the Janesville um, case. Oh, yeah, that's Wisconsin. It is. It's in, um, my congressional district. Um, Paul Ryan's home. Paul Ryan. Ryan. Yeah, <laughs> yes. there you go. Um, the, if it's an adjacent sector, yeah. And it requires a little bit of retooling, and you get to them quickly. Quickly is key, and you've got good referral services. Um, it can work. Yeah. And so we've got cases where there are, you know, plant closings that happen in Wisconsin. Kimberly Clark is looking to move out of Wisconsin, and the employers um, are descending upon those workers like nobody's business. Um, and and helping them to be retrained to modify their skills a bit, um, but it's in a similar kind of work um, in an adjacent sector or a similar sector, and those folks are going to be uh, employed the day they leave their other jobs. So it's not that it can't work, but it's a very, very difficult cultural and other transition uh, my town, Racine, was a huge UAW town, and when thousands and thousands of jobs, UAW jobs, went away, um, those UAW guys, many of whom I went to high school with, it's very hard for them to transition into a radically different kind of work. Mm. So we have two more questions, Marissa and then Anne-Marie. I'm going to ask you guys if you could each ask your questions, and sure. then we'll ask you to respond to them as you wish. Okay. Hi, I'm Marisa Novara. I'm with the Metropolitan Planning Council in Chicago. My question is for Greg. Um, and you, it's in regards to community benefits agreement. And um, you're probably aware that we have a presidential center coming to the south side of the city in a neighborhood named Woodlawn. And there's been a lot of debate and discussion around the role of a CBA when um, when we're talking about a uh, foundation versus a for-profit company. And in fact, the argument that the Obama Foundation uh, folks have made is um, we're not making a profit off of anyone. We are the community benefit, and we'll do most of what you all are asking for anyway. And the folks that are pushing for it are saying, that's great, just put that in writing, because why, why not? Um, and why won't you do that as the former community organizing president? So there's been a lot of pushback around this locally and a lot of, um, I think, uh, upset. And so I'm curious your thoughts on that. Oh, right. Um, sorry. Along those lines, um, so I get a little annoyed when we keep referencing the national average of unemployment being 4.1%, because that masks, as has been talked about, all the subgroup and the regional and the city variation and within city and between state and all this stuff. And in fact, if we really look at the data, we find a rise in non-standard precarious employment. At the same time, we're finding a rise in wage inequality, uh, economic inequality. So I've been working with the group for, through um, the German Marshall Fund to try to explore transatlantically what we can do to address, when we talk about inclusivity, what we can do to also address wage and, um, and quality of work. And I'm just wondering, I find it's really hard because it's a macro thing to kind of bump up against a very local thing. So I don't know if you have any solutions, but I'd love to hear your thoughts. All right, you want to do the first yeah, one so, first? So um, thank you for raising the Obama Presidential Library Community <laughs> Benefits fight. I've read some about it. I have not consulted or dealt directly with the campaign there. I know some people that are. Um, it's, a, it's astonishing that they're resisting, in my opinion. Um, they're taking public land. They're taking tax-exempt status. 
there's public money involved in this and lots of public infrastructure and services. Um, the profit thing doesn't mean it, that makes it immaterial to me. It's a big institution disrupting an existing public space uh, and therefore they have every right to expect to hold, a high, hold it to a high standard. Don't forget also too, there's a movement in a number of cities now to, to, to exact what are called pilots, right? Payments in lieu of taxes from big eds and meds, from libraries, from universities, right? Who've been off the tax rolls for all these years and getting a free ride on public services. So, um, you know, tell the library people to sit down and do the right thing. That's my opinion. And as to the second question, thank you for raising that. Um, because in, in our case, where I'm deeply invested in my city, um, you know, the overall unemployment rate in the city is low fours, four, one, four, two. And a lot of economists would say, oh, you've got full employment. But everything we do, we disaggregate by race, gender, age. Single, the single largest driver in the differential between our unemployment rate and the state's unemployment rate is single moms, lack of educational attainment, African American or Hispanic status. And that unemployment rate ain't 4%. And so, um, and then we have, you know, the work that's been done by Raj Tetney and, um, you know, on the African American men, right? So you have to always, always, always disaggregate by race and ethnicity, by gender, by age, and by uh, socioeconomic status. And then you see what's really going on. OK, I think that's uh, all the time we have. Let's thank our panel. That was, that was great. Great session.